Please welcome our final speaker, the Director, Marine Corps Staff Headquarters, Lieutenant General Greg Olson. Well, thank, thank you for the welcome, though I would, I would save my applause, uh, save your applause for the end. I, I'm acutely aware that I'm following some real, real luminaries, and I would like to uh, just let uh, you know, Admiral Garvin, I'm, I'm terribly sorry that I could not make it in person. This is not my preferred method of presentation, but I hope that we'll uh, still be able to achieve some good interaction. Uh, I want to say a particular welcome to our joint force colleagues and our colleagues from both international fora and, and from academia. I'm, I'm humbled to be in your presence. Look, I'm a Marine, so I'm, and I'm also speaking at the Navy, uh, Naval War College, so I know I'm required, I think by statute, to do three things. I'm required to mention Mahan, Corbett, and Guadalcanal. So I'll get Guadalcanal out of the way right off the front. Two of the three books that I recommend to any group of young officers to whom I'm presenting current Marine Corps events, current Marine Corps efforts, current Marine Corps requirements, two of the three books that I recommend revolve around the events of the Guadalcanal campaign. The first is Horn Fisher's Neptune's Inferno. Because I think better than almost any other book I've read, it presents a picture of the challenges of war at sea at the high end against a peer competitor and against a backdrop of whether you may or may not emerge victorious from the engagement. The second book I present for consideration is Richard Tregaskis's 1943 war diary called Guadalcanal Diary. Again, it presents an intimate look at a nation kicking off a war against a backdrop of great uncertainty in a challenging environment far from home. In combination, those two books would help a junior officer who has only experienced the relatively clean wars of the last 20th century with a picture of what the wars of the next century might be. At the apex of our power in 1945, the sea services had 7,600 ships, six infantry divisions, five air wings, nearly 4 million sailors, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen under arms. In the previous four years, Henry Kaiser's shipyards had kicked out 1,490 ships, some built in as little as five days. In one year alone, the Kaiser Yards put out 18 Casablanca class escort carriers. That's a 500 foot, 10,000 ton ship. We know how to do war at scale. And the Pax Americana that we enabled with our and our allied efforts in World War II created a new international rules-based order that persists to today. And a key component of that is freedom of navigation, maritime commerce, and moving about 80% of the world's economy over the surface of the ocean. We have not, however, been the sole beneficiaries of that new prosperity. Allies and adversaries alike have gained access to markets and commodities previously unimaginable to those who could not attain freedom of movement on the seas. Ironically, even those who challenge the current rules-based international order benefit from that very order that they challenge. And that freedom of movement of the seas has not been the norm through history. It's always been contested. And only since World War II have there been no significant contests to freedom of navigation. But more on that later, because we're going to take a little excursion into the Red Sea. Our obligation to maintain freedom of the maritime commons remains, but it's becoming increasingly difficult. The significance of the threat that we face is posed not only by our pacing challenge, but by those who their technology enables. Not since World War II have we faced adversaries so capable of challenging our primacy at sea. Whether it's anti-access and area denial capabilities become exponentially more capable by ubiquitous surveillance, we now have the largest conventional threat that we've seen in decades. As I noted, in the Red Sea, even a minor actor can have significant impacts on global prosperity. 
the simple result of having to navigate around the Cape of Good Hope instead of using the Suez Canal and the Bab al Mandeb, both choke points in narrow seas, adds 2,000 nautical miles and seven to 10 more days of transit time between Europe and the Strait of Malacca. That's 10 days of fuel, 10 days of crew wages, and 10 days of delay to what has become the norm, just-in-time manufacturing. Who pays for those increases in insurance? Who pays for those increased transit time and stress on the supply chain? Well, you and I do, and our families, and our friends, and our neighbors, and people around the world. What's at risk is no less than the international system that allows all peoples to benefit from trade on the global commons. Imagine the effect on global prosperity should deterrence fail in the Indo-Pacific and the sea lanes of the South China Sea become denied. Imagine the cost of keeping them open should a shooting war over Taiwan occur. We need to be clear-eyed. Our potential adversaries, be they near peers or second tier malign actors, possess the capabilities to kill Americans at scale, to sink capital ships, and the loss of life that could be experienced is a foreign concept to most Americans, even those of us who experience some of the hardest fighting in Afghanistan or Iraq. The low density of our platforms, their sophistication, and the challenges our industrial-based struggles with, for me, paint a grim picture of our ability to reconstitute our forces. We are still the most powerful military in the world, hands down. Alongside our allies and partners, we become even stronger. But in our assessments, we must take into account where our relative power is, both when the conflict begins and as the conflict unfolds. Our strategies must reflect those realities and our planning must indicate a high propensity for protraction. Between now and the commencement of the next near peer fight, we need to do everything we can to close the gaps and set the theater in a support for our success. Whether it's with the maritime administration, interagency, or industry, we need to work with all of them because their success begets our success. And we must recognize the whole of government nature of peer competition. Access, basing, and overflight are not a military problem. They are a whole of government problem. That's but one perspective on maritime statecraft. Now I want to give you a glimpse into how the core plays a role in it. We got a head start about five years ago when two previous commandants ago identified our deficiencies for a looming near peer fight. We are mid stride in our implementation of the correction of those deficiencies, and many of our investments are fielding today. We've in get invested heavily in maritime domain awareness and the underlying communications architecture. We have developed and are fielding long range precision fires meant to project, po project power not just from sea to land, but from land to sea. We've introduced concepts such as expeditionary advanced base operations and the idea of stand-in forces. Combining those forces with our organic mobility provided by both our aviation combat element and an updated amphibious ship. We can be a shield of many blows in the defense, or we can achieve the virtues of, concentra of, virtues of mass without the vulnerabilities of concentration. We can be your all-domain joint tactical air controller for the joint force. We want to stand in, in the first island chain or in the narrow seas of the far north, be ready to hold targets at risk and assist in prosecuting those targets. Our sensors and other sensors can be combined into kill webs that include every sensor and the best weapons. We need to be clear. These are additive capabilities to what your core does day to day and what the core has always brought to the fight. We can put sea lanes of communication at risk by seizing and defending key naval terrain in support of a maritime campaign as part of the joint force. We speak both Corbett and Mahan. As General Adams, our Programs and Resources Director said a couple of weeks ago, maneuver warfare remains our doctrine. Expeditionary advanced based operations and stand-in forces are just tools in the maneuver warfare toolkit. Yes, we're focused on domain awareness and being the all-domain JTAC, 
But what we're really focused on is enabling faster joint force decision making. Our stand-in forces will create dilemmas for the enemy as they try to find, fix, and finish our small signature distributed forces. We will expand their requirement to observe, orient, decide, and act, and that will enable our speed of action inside their OODA loop. In fact, the additional tools that we're buying, fielding, and experimenting with actually align the Marine Corps better with the modern variations of our Title X responsibilities to seize or defend advanced naval bases and conduct land operations as may be essential to the prosecution of a naval campaign. We can directly contribute to both sea control and sea denial fights while adding a threat to the board that our adversary is not used to taking into account, that of distributed forces that can move laterally in the littorals in small, hard to detect packets that pack a punch. A mental model might be that of the fleet in being. Because it exists, regardless of whether it is at sea or in port, the adversary must put resources to account for it. In our case, think of us as a threat in being, and the resources we're talking about are advanced ISR, advanced sensors, advanced munitions, but most importantly, the highly trained humans that enable these naval kill webs to find, fix, and finish adversaries. We're on the right track, but we do have some challenges. Updating our force and remaining creative about its employment has always been a hallmark of the Marine Corps. It's what we do in the interwar periods, and we are clearly right now in an interwar period. Our assistant commandant has stated publicly, we, speaking of the collective naval we, require more resources. He said, this is not about parochialism, it is about prioritization. For the core, that means getting to 31 amphibious warfare ships, 10 big decks, 21 LPDs, with the big deck amphibs built on no less than four-year centers, and the LPDs built on no less than two-year centers. Industry can do it. The experiences of the 1940s showed just how creative we can be when the requirements are there and the resources follow. In fact, the LPD construction program is the highest performing of all of the ship construction efforts the Department of the Navy is undertaking. We just don't say that enough. As a group of leaders, I think we must all work hard to eliminate any zero sum mentality or any perception that has come up from time to time that we are in competition with each other. We naval services are not. We're in competition with the adversary and we're in competition for the, the resources that the nation must prioritize against their war fighting forces. A dollar spent on the Marines is not a dollar that isn't going to the Navy, nor is it vice versa. A naval force should do everything it can to both increase all of its capabilities and their slice of the resource pie. There are structural obstacles that prevent us from receiving a larger share of available resources. The enduring nature of continuing resolutions, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, diminishing purchasing power against the backdrop of inflation, all of those put pressure on the dollars available to both modernize and operate the naval services. Because we have to meet the challenge of a looming near peer fight against the backdrop of doing our day-to-day -day work on behalf of the nation. Last week at the Marine Corps University, our commandant said, we cannot expect the world to take a knee and give us a breather while we modernize. We have to do both current ops and modernization. I spent a considerable amount of water, uh, time on the water in my career, and I have a deep appreciation for what our Navy brings to the fight. We have a lethal surface fleet but I am keenly aware that our true advantage lies in other domains. We need to persuade external audiences that the Marine Corps is equally as applicable in the space domain, cyber domain, information domain, and as, an, as a supporter of the undersea domain. Marines do very, very well technically. We were pioneers getting our toe into the cyber pool very early on, 
And now our cyber force Marines are among the most highly sought of any of the cyber components. We need to do the same in all those other domains and we need to be prepared to enable undersea activities. It warms my heart when I hear a Marine talk about water space management, because it's something we're gonna have to consider in the next fight if we are truly gonna to contribute to the Naval campaign. What do I ask of all of you as Naval strategists? I've now given you a sense of where the Marine Corps is moving in the next two years, the next few years and the challenges we face. What I would ask is that we all become acolytes and advocates for the successes that the Naval forces currently enjoy, whether it's Task Force 76-3, Task Force 61-2, where we interoperate with our allies and partners such as we just completed in Balakatan or in Northern Edge. We need to get the word out and highlight the operations and activities of our integrated efforts. We need to talk where Navy Marine Corps integration is working in real world, achieving tangible results. When we do so, we win. We win with the public and we win on the Hill, which is where the resource battle truly occurs. Secondly, I'd ask for your continued feedback to your counterparts about how we're doing as a Corps. As General Berger, our previous Commandant asked, what does the Navy need from the Marine Corps? That is not a one-liner. That is a sincere entreaty for feedback. The answers to those questions helped inform force design, and it's been at the heart of our modernization effort. Consider you might be a fleet commander. Maybe you're responding to a crisis in your region, a crisis that involves islands, lots of littoral real estate, and a whole bunch of adversary ships. Perhaps in this scenario, you can find a way to think of your U.S. Marines on some of those islands as stand-in forces, adding lateral distribution and physical depth to your battle space. What would you want them to do for you as part of the joint force? Would you want them to employ their organic weapons and sensors to deny swaths of the ocean or maritime choke points? Or perhaps use them to create maneuver space for your fleet assets? or perhaps simply watch, listen, and report without unmasking their capabilities until a critical uh, point in time and space. How would you capitalize on the decision space a land-based sea denial force might provide you? Imagine what Ukraine could do in the Black Sea if they had a Navy capable of supporting the successes they are achieving from land. It's a symbiosis, the stand-in forces and the maneuver forces of the Marine Corps and those of the fleet. That's the ultimate expression of Navy Marine Corps integrations. And it's gonna happen in the next peer fight. What we can't do is in the interwar period, develop our concepts in stovepipes. The whole idea is that we'll be fighting together. So we need to plan that way from now until the fight breaks out. So, Pete, I'm, I'm really sorry I couldn't be there today. I would much rather uh, be in the audience, uh, you know, be of the audience. I, I looked at the speakers you had. Gosh, I wish I would have been in the, in the audience myself taking notes, because when you start thinking about Michael Hanlon's and Andy Krapenovich's and, and people like that, I can't listen to them enough. Uh, it's been my pleasure being here with you today, and I look forward to seeing all of you in the fleet or in a classroom someday. So best of luck. Don't lose sight of your class. Don't lose touch with your classmates. You're going to need them. Okay. <clears throat>